Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is David Proman, and I'm really happy to chair today's session of the UK Quantum Networks uh, seminars webinar series. Uh, so today we have uh, Gabriel Laszlowski uh, from uh, Warsaw University of Technology, but also from University of Washington. Um, that is uh, going to give a talk on thermionic superfluidity from single vortex dynamics to quantum turbulence. Mm -hmm. uh, Gabriel uh, is uh, actually, um, um, as a background actually in nuclear physics, and uh, he does not, I would say, um, directly belong to, to the quantum fluids community, but he has interest in quantum fluids due to his interest in neutron stars. And aside of that, he's also very interested in um, numerical uh, simulations of quantum fluids uh, and high performance in computing. And in particular, uh, in his research, he applies a lot uh, methods uh, uh, related to density functional theory. Um, so please, Gabriel, uh, unmute yourself, and we're really keen to listen to your talk today. Thank you for accepting. To give yes, thank you. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, in the title, I used phrase thermionic superfluidity, which is a very broad uh, area of researches, but just to focus here in this webinar, Actually, by thermionic superfluidity, I mean a thermionic in ultra cold thermionic uh, in ultra cold gases of thermionic type. So, in lab, basically, we have uh, two types of ultra cold gases depending on isotope. They can be either fermions, effectively, uh, they can behave like a fermions or like bosons. Uh, bosonic studies are much far, I mean, far advanced in comparison to fermions. Branch and in many things that we do with fermions, actually, it's inspired by, by researches that were done in, a, in bosons. So, from general point of view, the, the scientific question that um, we try to contribute to is following what is the impact of quantum statistics on superfluid dynamics? Uh, as example, I can pose the question, can we distinguish and have a boson or thermal superfluid when looking at superfluid dynamics? For example, these are snapshots from recent experiment by Lenz group where uh, dipole of vertices were observed, the, the propagation of dipole of vertices. So they, they propagate and then they go around the, uh, around the cloud <clears throat> and uh, merge here again. So whether we can distinguish what is the, what is the system under hood, whether it's a bosonic or, or fermionic system. So uh, mostly in this webinar, I will be comparing between Bose and Fermi superfluids and uh, will be interested in looking for differences. I mean, what are differences between these two branches? And uh, what are the options if you want to compare Bose and Fermi superfluids? Of course, we can use helium superfluids. We have a two helium isotopes, helium-4 and helium-3. Uh, and this is a very active area of research with very interesting physics. Uh, with uh, helium-3, there is additional le uh, level of complication, namely the Cooper pairing. It's in the chum, I mean, uh, the Cooper pairs have uh, angular momentum equal one and total spin equal one. So we call it that we have a, a P wave spin triplet superfluidity and that uh, introduces uh, new interesting physics, but also introduces a lot of I mean, the, the complications with comparing with helium four. On the other hand, we can use also chakra datums. Uh, in this case, the superfluidity, it's, we have a S wave superfluidity. And that's the simplest form of superfluidity in a Fermi systems that we can have. So that simplifies. And also, uh, so-called BEC BCS crossover can be can be realized experimentally, which actually allows to compare directly the, the, the both regimes, bosonic and fermionic, within the same physical system. Uh, 
I forgot to mention that if you have any question, uh, questions, you can ask me anytime during the, during the seminar. So in that case, please interrupt me. Okay, so what is BCSBC crossover? Uh, so we consider fermionic gas with attractive interparticle interaction. And uh, so BCS regime corresponds to the case where we have a weakly in, weak interactions between fermions. So in that case, uh, only correlations are created. And these correlations has, have form of Cooper pairs. As we increase the interaction strength between the particles, the strength of the correlations also increases and it's manifested by decreasing the size of the Cooper pair. So in, we have a limit, I mean, we have a regime of strong interactions. And in this regime, the, the size of the Cooper pair is of the same order as interparticle distance <coughs> uh, between particles. Uh, in many cases, we, we call this, <coughs> Uh, this point, which is characterized by dimensionless coupling constant, which is Fermi energy times scattering length. Uh, we refer this point as a unitary Fermi gas. And if we increase further the interaction between fermions, it's attractive interaction. So at some point, this interaction generates bound states. So two fermions with opposite spin create a bound state. And these bound states <coughs> are dimers effectively bosons and if one computes the interaction between the the dimers it's weak so we have a weakly interacting bose gas here and uh, the, the bc bcs crossover was already realized in experiment in 2005 so 17 years ago these are snapshots uh, from the paper by martin Sverling showing the lattice of vortices in uh, uh, all three interaction regimes, weakly interacting Bose gas, strongly interacting Fermi gas, and weakly interacting Fermi gas. And um, <clears throat> here in this webinar, I, I will be looking at the problem from a theoretical point of view. So in order to do that, we need some methods, theoretical methods, how we can study uh, such systems. And uh, because I'm interested in compare, I mean, the, the, the checking what is the influence on the quantum statistics, basically I'm interested in microscopic methods where we deal with a wave function. Because in these methods, uh, I mean, the, the wave function, it's actually the, um, the element that encodes whether we have a Fermi or, or a boss, depending on the symmetry of the wave function. So in case of, uh, BEC side, of course, we can use a very popular gross Pitayevsky equation, right? So in, in this case, we just assume that dimers are my uh, degrees of freedom, and and I model the whole system by a single bosonic uh, uh, wave function. Uh, so so the, the modification to the, the gross Pitayevsky equation is that instead of uh, mass of, of dimer, I use two times mass of fermions. Each dimer consists of two fermions. And then coupling constant, which enters here, uh, describes the effective interaction between dimers. So it's not the, the coupling constants that characterizes the Fermi-Fermi uh, Fermi interaction, but effective interaction between dimers. Uh, very popular approach with relatively low numerical complexity, and this low numerical complexity typically allows to study uh, systems consisting of thousands of, of bosons numerically. On the other hand, um, if we consider the weakly interacting Fermi gas, um, the theory that uh, mathematically it's well justified, it's Bogolyubov Dijan theory, or Bogolyubov Dijan when, apply, when applied to uniform system becomes equivalent to BCS theory. So that's the, that's the name. So in, in, in this theory, we, this, uh, we model the quasi-particle states that are described by a Bogolyubov of amplitudes. So we have a quasi-particle states. We have a, a Bogolyubov of Dijon Hamiltonian matrix, which has a single particle Hamiltonian. This part describes the kinetic energy of fermions and 
uh, trapping potential. You have some, uh, some trapping potential. And all the diagonal terms are so called pairing potential. And this term describes the Cooper pairs, the correlations between particles with opposite spins. And that's the only place where the interaction enters to this description. So, in, in other words, in Vogel Libov Dijen uh, description, the, the role of the interaction is just to create the pairing correlations in the in the system. <clears throat> so, so mathematically, this uh, this this is well justified if dimensionless coupling constant is much smaller than one. Uh, in this method, we do not have a single wave function. We have a many quasi-particle states that we that we evolve in time. And this is actually the place where Pauli exclusion principles enters to, to the game. Right? That in each quasi-particle, in each state, we, have, we can have only one quasi-particle, one quasi-particle, and all of them must be orthonormal to each other all the time. So <clears throat> Uh, the fact that now we uh, evolve many quantum states, many quasi-particle states, introduces this extra factor here. So now that the numerical scaling is n squared log n, that <clears throat> that means that this method costs more than, than simulations with Rosbitevsky equation. Well, when thinking about synergy between theory and experiment, uh, you may notice that. Uh, that actually in experiment we never have uh, weakly interacting Fermi gas in, in, in a superfluid state. It is because the critical temperature for the fermionic superfluids uh, decays exponentially as we go to the to the weak interactions. So 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 this is the the, the regime where actually the BCS theory it's it's well justified. The di dimensionless coupling constant is smaller than one. On the other hand, in, in, in real experiments, the, typically the, the, the lowest temperature that can be uh, that, that that the system can be cooled down it's about five percent of uh, Fermi temperature. So that means that uh, te technically we may approximately we may study systems <clears throat> in labs. Up to this point, so so the, the coupling constant actually is bigger than one, and that that means that we, that the effect of interaction can cannot be neglected, right? So so here I show again the the, the snap uh, the, the experimental results where where experimental is actually attached the, the label BCS regime, but when when we look at the the, the dimensionless coupling constant, uh, it, it's it's bigger than one. Here it's one point five. That was in two thousand five. Here, as I exam uh, as example, I show experiment from 2018 where also vortices were were, were observed. These dots here are, are vortices in three different interaction regimes. So not much changed since that time. Again, the the, the dimensionless coupling constant is bigger than one. So actually, what we have in the lab. <coughs> Is a system where interactions cannot be neglected. I mean, the, the, the interactions are still strong. Uh, in, in this graph, what I'm showing is a pairing potential as a function of uh, coupling constant. And uh, dots are results of quantum Monte Carlo calculations for a neutron matter. These are red dots. And black dots are results for ultra cold atomic gases. So, so in, in, in this regime, which is called, let's say, BCS regime, in, in, in experiments, we, we actually have a system which is very close to, uh, which is very similar to, to, to neutron matter, which is still strongly interacting system. Now, it, it doesn't mean that BCS theory is completely wrong, because if we look at the, at the trends, that are predicted by BCS theory. So lines are predictions of BCS theory in this case. Typically, BCS theory pred predicts correctly trends, but the problem is that it, it either overestimates or underestimates results, and that that introduces the complications when we would like, uh, if we want to compare with experimental data at some point. But there is a solution to this problem, namely mm, we can use density functional theory. That's the very popular method in solid state physics, quantum chemistry, 
or in, in nuclear physics, uh, here, here I'm showing the very, very popular diagram in, in nuclear physics where um, as in the typical methods that which are applied to different uh, elements are presented. So if we have a heavy elements, many nucleons, then the standard method that is used in nuclear physics is uh, density functional view. So this theory, in principle, it's exact. Uh, it's due to the Hohenberg conferum that implies that actually if, if, if you are interested in, in some observables, each observable can be written as a function of density. So it's it's enough to know density to, to extract observable. We don't need to know the wave function. And if this uh, if this operator here is Hamiltonian, then we have an uh, energy density and uh, minimization of energy density, then it's equivalent to solving Schrodinger equation. In, in, in a sense that if, if we look for the ground state properties, for example, for the ground state properties, we are looking for the state with the lowest energy. So that, that means that we can minimize energy density functional. So, 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 so here there is a mapping. We can do, do mapping between the solving Schrodinger equation and minimizing the energy density functional. However, the problem is that there is no recipe how to construct this functional. And in practice, we postulate the form of the functional. And this is how the, how actually the approximation enters to the theory. So in principle, the theory is exact, but in practice, it's not. Everything it depends how good functional is, how well it, uh, how well it uh, approximates the exact functional. However, what we can say about this method is that DFT allows to include beyond mean field effects. So the effects that cannot be described by, by, by simple mean field theory. Here by mean field, I, will, I understand what we brought this in, while keeping the numerical cost similar to the mean field methods. And that's the, 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 the biggest advantage of, of this method. <clears throat> so uh, in my group, we are using a so-called superfluid local density approximation. This name refers to the class of the functionals. I, I do not write here the explicitly the functional, but once we minimize the functional that belongs to this class, what do we get? Uh, we get the equations that are formally the same as Bogolyubov design equations. So again, we uh, we have a quasi-particle wave functions with differences that now the single particle Hamiltonian it's, uh, uh, has more elements. Uh, for, for example, we have an effective mass. So we say that if we have interactions, our particles are dressed by interactions. So they, they have a different uh, effective mass, which may depend on the density, so on the environment. We have an additional potential that simulates the effects of interactions. And we also may have uh, some vector potentials that <clears throat> depends on the currents. So, so, so the dynamics depends not only on the densities, but can also depend on the currents. And also the, the pairing potential. So this is the potential that describes the strength, how, how strongly Cooper pairs are bound. Uh, the coupling constant that enters here also acquires the uh, density dependence. So from a at qualitative level, the, the biggest difference in, in, in this description is, the, is that it introduces additional explicit coupling between density modes and pairing modes, because now the density is modes and pairing modes. This, the, the, this single rule here, we, we call it anomalous density. It's something that is proportional to the pairing gap, to the function that describes uh, the purpose. <clears throat> these, two are, these two modes are coupled. So in summary, uh, we have uh, three regimes. For each regime, we can uh, we have a dedicated method that we can apply. So Rospitajewski has a degree of freedom. We have a dimer scheme. And we just model the compensate wave function. While for, for strongly interacting and weakly interacting Fermi gases, we can we deal with methods where fermions are our degrees of freedom. 
and that causes that we need to uh, consider the quasi-particle states. Uh, I've, uh, the important, I mean, the, the thing that will be important during this webinar is that both methods, SLDA or um, density functional theory method, or uh, Bogolubov Dijen, they, they, they allow for the solutions where density of particles is non zero, while uh, delta is zero, I mean, the, the, the order parameter. Uh, in, in this field, uh, if we have a Cooper pairs, we have a superfluidity. If we don't have Cooper pairs, we don't have superfluidity. So, so delta works as an order parameter. And, and this phenomenon we call Cooper pair breaking. So the method allows to, to simulate the, the effects that we break the Cooper pairs, or in, other, or in other words, we destroy the condensate of Cooper pairs. Well, this cannot be, well, this, this is beyond reach of Rospitaev's where if we don't have uh, condensate, then we don't have density, right? Because these two, two, two quantities are, are related to each other. Uh, in this seminar, I, I focus on physics only, so I, I completely sk skip all details related to, uh, to, the, to the methods how we solve the equations. Uh, I, I just point that uh, we have a web page, so if, if, if someone of you is in, interested in the technical aspects, uh, of solving this equation. Here's the, here's the web page where we put um, all our codes, codes there, and also the, the, some, um, the, there are also some resources describing how we do it on, on, on the numerical, uh, on the technical level. So physics, let me go to discussing properties of quantum vertices in Bose and Fermi superfluids. So let me start with the, uh, with the vortex in a Bose gas, as predicted by a gross pitayevsky equation. So uh, in this case, <coughs> vortex is a, it's a topological defect. That means that uh, at some point, the order parameter vanishes. This is a topological point, And around this point, the phase rotates by 2 pi. We have rotation of the phase. And the gradient of this phase, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, related to the superfluid uh, flow, which is, uh, which is quantized. In this case, I mean, the circulation is it's quantized. Uh, but the design equations also predict solutions in the form of quantum vertices. Mm. But what are the differences? So in the value of design, there is no longer a direct relation between the density and the other parameter, which is the case of, of, of the Rospitaevsky equation. So when we look at the other parameter, the profile of, of, of delta, it behaves in the same way as, as the other parameter in the Rospitaevsky equation. So it takes by 2 pi, there is a topological point. Uh, but density is non zero inside the vertex core. And it's non zero because when solving the Bogolubov the design equations, we will find that there are, there are states with energies below the pairing gap. So these are the, the states inside the vertex core, and these states are occupied by uh, quasi particles. And occupation of the states causes non zero value of, of density inside inside the, the vortex core. Uh, these states are known as Andreev states in, in, in literature. So <clears throat> presence of these states um, introduces a new energy scale to the problem. We call this energy scale mini gap. So that's the distance from the, from the zero to the first state. And it also gives, gives us information about the average distance between between states in the vortex core. If we look, uh, I mean, these states are localized in a sense that if we just, in, in, in this plot what I'm showing here is, that that's the order parameter, absolute value of the order parameter. So, so here we have a zero and the phase rotates around each vortex. So these, these are dipoles of vertices. Uh, and if we just compute what is the contribution to the density coming only from the states inside the gap, so these are precisely the states inside the gap. 
we find that, uh, that, that, that these are these states are localized, so they, they, they correspond to the particles sitting in, in, in the vortices. So sometimes we, in literature, we, we use the statement that the uh, the cores of vortices in the fermionic superfluids are filled with the normal component in the sense that there is no pairing gap there. The other parameter is zero, but there is no zero density. <clears throat> and the mini gap energy scales like a pairing gap, where the pairing gap scales exponentially as we go to the BCS regime. So we have that in case of the weakly interacting fermi gas, we have a many Andre states that fill the vortices, so a lot of matter inside the cores. So we only have a small depletion of the of the density. So this plot shows the density as, as a function of distance from the center of the vortex. And then as we increase the strength of um, the interaction strength, pairing up also increases. So the number of Andreas states decreases. In the strongly interacting regime, we have only a few states inside of the core. And as we go to the BEC side, basically the, the mini gap becomes bigger than the pairing gap. And then we have no more states in the vortex core. The core becomes empty and that's how we recover the uh, gross pitorovsky solution. So using the interaction map, we can control the, the amount of matter that we have in the vortex core. <clears throat> Uh, these states inside the uh, vortex, the Andreev states, these are states that um, they have a well-defined un angular momentum. So on this graph, what, I, what I'm showing, uh, I have an um, angular momentum, so m quantum number, and here I have an energy of the of the state. I consider only the states inside the below the pairing gap, so inside the vortex core. So they, they have non-zero angular momentum, so the, the, the matter inside the vortex core rotates. Of course, because that's the fermionic system, each quasi-particle states, it's each quasi-particle that's, that's is, is inside the vortex core must have to a different quantum number because of Pauli principle. But of course, if, if we sum all states that we have in a uh, in my system and, and, and divided by number of Cooper pairs, we will recover the, the, the formula known from, from those superfluids that angular momentum per particle per, per Cooper pair is equal to H bar. Uh, here, I, so far, I didn't mention about the, another degree of freedom that we have. Namely, for the fibers, we have a spin degree of freedom. So we have a particles with spin up and spin down. And so far, I was assuming that uh, number of spin up and spin down particles is equal. But in general, we may have a different number of spin up and spin down particles. So technically, the, the, the way how we, how we introduce the population imbalance between two spin states is that we, we, we change the chemical potentials for a spin up and spin down particles. And this branch that I was showing, that the blue dots actually, because we have a spin up and spin down particles, it's degenerate. So if we introduce the spin imbalance, uh, we lift this degeneracy and one branch goes up, another branch goes down. And the, the, the effect that we, what we have at the end, we, we, we find that now for uh, spin imbalanced systems, now, inside the vortex core, we have a state which have a actually negative angular momentum. So, some of matter inside the vortex core rotates in an opposite direction. So, <clears throat> if we plot, for example, a velocity flow and the velocity field as a function of the distance from the vortex core, zero is the vortex core, that's the distance from the vortex core, that's the velocity field. Uh, so, uh, blue points, it's a spin symmetric system, so basically it, it decays like, like a 1 over R, but if we start to introduce the, the population imbalance, so then we change the way how the Andreev states are occupied inside the vortex, we, we can generate a situation that actually the 
the core is rotating in opposite direction than the rest of the vortex. So we have a core that is rotating, for example, in this direction, where the matter further further from the vortex rotates in an opposite direction. So, <clears throat> so, so, so the core is something that we can uh, using the, the interaction strength or population balance. That's something that, to some extent, we can control uh, its its structure. Uh, I will add here that uh, also in case of a spinning balance system that the majority particles, so the particles that cannot find the partner to create the Cooper pair, actually like to, like to accumulate inside in the core. So that's another property. And <clears throat> the question that we may ask, of course, it's <laughs> does it matter that we have something inside the core when, uh, if we consider dynamics? Like, is, is it significant? And then that does it produce significant effects or not? And uh, in literature, it's uh, it was already discussed in literature, in literature that that yes, it, it, it may produces some some effects. For example, in uh, in two thousand twelve, uh, uh made analogy that <clears throat> vortices actually can work as a as a containers that keep inside some matter particles and if such container is moving with acceleration for example we shake this container uh, <clears throat> effectively what we do we, we heat up the gas in, in that container and that may cause the uh, heat flux that it's coming out from, uh, from, from such box so the hypothesis is that when we have a vortex that I don't know, the Kelvin waves are propagating along the vortex, these Kelvin waves effectively heat up the matter in the vortex current. We may have a dissipation in a form that we excited the particles from the core that at some point they escape from the vortex and they take away energy. Uh, so, so dissipation mechanism will be an emission of quasi-particles from the vortex core. Uh, another mechanism that it's also discussed but uh, mainly in context of superfluid helium-3, it's so-called spectral flow. It's, it's additional contribution to the forces acting on the vortex line coming from the process that it's related to the relaxation of uh, core bound fermions towards the equilibrium. So if, if vortex is moving, we excite the vortex core and then due to relaxation. Uh, that may produce some additional dissipation force. <clears throat> so, um, uh, so these are um, mechanisms that were proposed. However, I think that since today we don't have uh, direct evidence that um, they are in action. Uh, but what I'm showing here you know, on, on this simulation is it's, it's, it's a process of reconnection of two vertices and this dust, which is around the vertex, is showing the uh, particles that sit in the Andreyev state. So, so these are particles that are inside the vertex core. So as the vertices uh, propagate, they follow the vertex lines, which are shown here by orange line. And then now we have a reconnection process. And during this reconnection process, we, we, we find that the, the particles that were sitting originally in the vertex core <clears throat> are gone. So, so they, they, they were ejected from the, from the vertex and you know, spread over the system. So, so probably they took some energy. So uh, in other words, what we expect, we expect that energy transfers during the let's say the connection events or during the vortex dynamics, the, the propagation of Kelvin waves will be slightly different in the case of fermionic superfluids. We know that in case of the Bose superfluids, the sound wave is emitted. Here I provide a very nice uh, figure from, from recent paper from 2020 where this, this effect was studied in, in, in a greater details. So the same we expect here in the case of, uh, of a fermi fermionic uh, vortices. And in addition to that, we expect that part of energy will be, will be also consumed to, to excite the vortex core. So, but this needs to be confirmed. 
on a more detailed calculations, which uh, I think it's uh, presently that there is no such such calculations in, in the literature. But uh, the presence of the internal vortex structure doesn't mean that basically all properties of vortex dynamics are, are modified. Uh, for example, it it, it, it is uh, speculate uh, it is conjectured that uh, if we look at the uh, evolution of the minimal distance between two vortices during the reconnection process, uh, it, it, it is speculated that so, sorry, it is conjectured that it uh, <clears throat> follows some power law precisely that it scales like a square root of time. And the scaling can be justified using the dimensional arguments. I took, <clears throat> I, I took this uh, dimensional arguments from, from, the, uh, from the paper from 2019, where the interaction with those, uh, uh, so the vertex reconnections, the Bosa superfluids were studied, in, uh, uh, were studied. Uh, the same scaling, I mean, in, in this scaling, we, we just assume that uh, the only relevant scale is it's quanta of circulation. So if we have only this um, parameter, so the only combination that actually, uh, and time, the only combination that can give a distance, it's square root of time times, <clears throat> times kappa. And this, this can be also even more strictly justified when uh, the, the scaling can be derived from gross Pitevsky equation, assuming that inside the vertex core, basically, there is no matter, so we can uh, neglect the, the nonlinear term. Uh, it, it looks to be a very tempting idea that uh, as, uh, to assume that uh, the scaling holds also for uh, all types of superfluids. However, in case of the thermonic superfluids, if we assume that we have a densities inside the vertex core, there is no, uh, a priori, there is no, no reason to rule out this possibility that also density somehow contributes to the, to the, the, the internal structure of the vertex core contributes to the reconnection dynamics. However, this is not the case. This is not the case that it's seen in the, in the numerics. When, when, when executing them, when studying the, uh, the reconnection in, uh, using the numerics, basically what, so far what we found is that in all cases that we considered, so we are considering the gross pitevsky equation, of course, just to, just to check that we, we can indeed uh, reproduce the known results from those superfluids, and then when, when apply the same method to them strongly interacting or weakly interacting thermionic system. We see that uh, <clears throat> the distance, this, uh, here what I show on this axis, there is a time to reconnection. That's the distance between vertices. And that, that uh, this minimal distance as a function of time scales in bit like a square root of time. And it's very independent on the, on the vertex core structure. Like we also were considering this exotic states where we have a reversed flow inside the vortex core, or, 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 yeah, in, in spin and balanced system. So, so this property indeed looks to be very universal and, and, and seems to be holding in all three types of superfluids that, that at least we, we were considering. And the last point, now I, I would like, uh, I would like to move to, to even more complex system, where now we have a many vortices. So these vortices can uh, interact with each other and create a complex structures. So then we have a, um, the state that it's called the quantum turbulence. Uh, in, in, in this year, actually, we published the paper where, where we are considering the turbulence in a, in a rotating, I mean, rotating turbulence. By rotating turbulence, uh, I mean the case where we have a many vertices, but the total angular momentum of the system it's it's non-zero. So, in our setup, we started with a lattice of vertices, like a Briscoe lattice, 
and then on so we have a gas confined in a tube we have our brisco lattice of vortices and then we imprint the solitons so we, we imprinted the phase pi to our order parameter. <clears throat> and this imprinting works like an injection of energy to the system. So we want to excite the system, create the, some non-trivial dynamics. So, so solitons in a, in a three-dimensional systems are, uh, are uh, unstable, they decay. Uh, they decay, and when they decay, they produce the vortices which tangle the, the vortex lattice. So, <clears throat> so what we have are, are our solitons just decay, they create a tangle of the vortex lattice, and then the system evolves and again tries to restore the, the vortex lattice, so dissipates energy, the flow energy, and, and tries to go back to the, to the initial state. <clears throat> Uh, the difference between the initial state and the final state is that the final state is excited because we injected energy, so we started from this level, dynamically imprinted solitons, injected energy to the system, so at the end we have a, again the vertex lattice, but at the excited, at the excited state. And since there is no, um, no experimental data that we could compare with because there is no experiments with turbulence for a Fermi cases. What we do, we do a comparative study between the predictions of the gross pitayevsky equation and, and uh, Fermionic theory. So uh, in, in practice, we use a slightly modified gross pitayevsky equation where instead of uh, using nonlinear term, which is uh, tapping constant times density square, we use a term which is uh, which has a scaling as uh, as for the Fermionic system, so the density to power five over three, so slightly different, but close to two. And because this is a rotating quantum turbulence, we 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 consider this in a rotating frame system. So we do the basically the same simulations using the Gross-Pitayevsky, which assumes that we have a condensate of Cooper pairs. That's why we have the 4m here, mass of which Cooper uh, pair is two times fermionic mass. And what we find is that <clears throat> indeed, I mean, the, the gross pitayevsky can only produce at a qualitative level, basically, the, the fermionic calculations if we assume explicitly that we have uh, some dissipation. So that gives us information that actually the, the fermionic formulation already has some mechanism that. Uh, works like a dissipation coefficients so, so, so this is a dissipation coefficient which we include as a uh, um, for the complex time formulation but when injecting energy in a gross pitayevsky model basically we find that when we inject energy it goes to the vertices so what i'm showing here is the time and that's the total length of vertices so total length of vertices increases we generate the tangle and then it starts to decay. In case of fermions, when we inject energy, part of energy goes somewhere else. So basically, the, the, the total amount of vorticity that we have at the end sorry, is, uh, is much smaller than what we see in a cross That means that there is something else that actually consumes energy from, from, from the injection. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, to, to figure out what is the something else, uh, we can make a, I mean, analysis of Kelvin waves actually helps to, to figure out what, 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 what might be the source of that. Because our system has, has this structure that we have now many vertices that are stretching from the, from the tube. I can parameterize. I mean, what we do, we parameterize each, uh, each vertex point by uh, coordinates, coordinates X and Y that depends on the Z coordinate the height here. So that's the typical procedure from, from literature that we construct the variable, which is X times IY. So complex variable and making Fourier transform. Uh, we, 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 <clears throat> we have a, a, we can construct the spectra of Kelvin waves. Precisely the spectra of Kelvin waves, it's, uh, 
we, we, we take a modulus square of, of w, w function. And in this case, because I, we have a many vertices, we take average of, over all vertices. So <clears throat> what I'm showing here is a, is a spectrum that, uh, that it's obtained using either the gross model, that's the gray line, or using uh, DFT, as a density function, if you will, the first fermionic formulation. Blue line is basically spin symmetric system. We also added a red line, which is spin and balanced system. So in spin and balanced, we have a different number of spin up and spin down particles. But what's, what's most important here that if you look at the late times of the evolution of the system, we find that there is something that uh, dumps Kelvin waves of low, uh, low wave number. So, so, so there is significant difference between what what Gross-Pitayevsky predicts and what, what the other method predicts. This is logarithmic scale. So this actually, this difference here, it's, it's about two orders of magnitude. So, so it's significant. And uh, similar dumping, dumping of Kelvin waves uh, is seen in a vertex filament model simulations if it is coupled to a normal component, so if mutual friction is actually taken into account. Here I put some references uh, showing such, such, such results. So that suggests that uh, in a fermionic <coughs> systems, basically we have uh, active the uh, per breaking mechanism. So when we inject energy, part of energy goes to the to the flow, but part of energy just breaks the Cooper purse. And this broken Cooper purse basically may act as a thermal reservoir or nova component that couples with, with superfluid component. So this is a speculation because we don't have a we don't have any uh, <clears throat> any strong arguments I mean, uh, uh, showing that, um, I mean, we speculate that it might be that the fermionic approach may provide us some microscopic self consistent method that allows at least partially to study phenomena like mutual friction between superfluid and normal components. Okay, I exhausted time, so that, that's summary of my talk. Um, basically, <clears throat> today. Um, the, the microscopic simulations for, for across the whole BCS BC crossover are, are feasible. We have dedicated methods for each of the interaction regimes that you can apply. Topological defects in a fermionic superfluids have internal structure, and this internal structure may uh, I mean introduces an additional mechanism for the dissip dissip dissipative processes that we may have. And uh, yeah, <clears throat> vertex reconnections, we, we find that uh, some, the, the aspect like uh, scaling, it's, it's, uh, it's not affected by the internal structure, but there are other things that are affected by, by uh, appearance of the uh, Andreev states inside the topological defects, in particular, the, the quantum turbulence might be affected by the by the presence of, of normal component. Okay, um, so I think the key message is that basically the, 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 the element that differentiate between the Bose and Fermi superfluids is basically the dissipative mechanisms that in, in Fermi superfluids we have more channels, more ways how the energy can, can be dissipated. Okay, thank you for, for your attention and I also provide a list of collaborators that contributed to, uh, to the results that I was showing here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel, for this really nice talk uh, about all these results on, on Fermi fluids. Um, yeah, so uh, if you have any question, please uh, unmute yourself, um, or maybe raise your hand, and then when I when I call your name, unmute yourself and feel free to ask the question that you want. Um, maybe.
in the meanwhile, I can I can ask a very quick question. So so you mentioned that somehow you, uh, if I got it right, so you you don't really um, know exactly the detailed mechanism of these dissipative effects. Uh, so so just as a matter of curiosity, so if, if you simulate, for example, a Fermi fluid in, in two dimensions or in three dimensions, but with very easy configurations, like, I don't know, a dipole or a vortex ring or, or two or two corrotating vortex points or, or, or lines, can you, can you, I mean, is it easier to, to somehow uh, to quantify those dissipative effects using this, this easy, easier configurations? Are there any experiments, um, numerical simulations on that? Yes, of, of course, reduced dimensionality um, simplifies the problem. Uh, <clears throat> let, let, let me just uh, pick up the correct slide. But of course, the, 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 this is what, uh, uh, what we also try to, to look at. And this is precisely the, the, the experiment that was conducted uh, very recently that uh, vortex dipoles were, uh, were observed or, or there was also collision of, of, of these dipoles. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> this is a simplified configuration and uh, we, yes, we, we try to look at that and see what is happening with, with our um, we, and what, what is the source of the dissipation mechanism? The problem is that, um, I mean, the, typically in, in the experiment, we have a temperature which is now zero. And if we make a computation and look what is the uh, what are the thermal excitations, uh, I'm jumping now to this, right. <clears throat> we have this mini gap energy here. So that's the distance to the lowest energy state. And if, if one compares for the, uh, for the experiments that are conducted in a so-called BCS site, if one compares the, what is the size of the mini gap energy and the average value of the thermal fluctuations energy, so Boltzmann constant time temperature, they are of the same order. That means that from the point of view of the vortex dynamics, mm -hmm. that the, the vertices are already excited due to the thermal fluctuations. I see. And that um, causes a, um, so that's another level of complications that uh, basically we should take into account if you would like to compare directly with the experimental predictions. And it's not easy task to have a absolutely. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you, Gabriel. So I think that I saw I saw first the Samuli and then Yuri probably raising their hands. So um, apologies if it's, if I'm swapping the order, but please, Samuli, just just unmute, unmute yourself and then and All then right. Yuri. Thanks, thanks, Davide, and uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, well, there are other people here who might be able to comment. Uh, on this from the perspective of vortices in helium-3. But um, I was going to ask you, uh, or first of all, point, point out that there are experiments where if we insert uh, <clears throat> an object in, in superheat helium-3, um, it will be surrounded by a similar layer of uh, or region where the gap is stressed, as, as shown in this figure, which you have on this slide in the vortex core. And now moving the, the object will then um, disturb the uh, bound states in that region. And we, we've got uh, a couple of recent papers where this effect is studied and the escape of the quasi-particles to the bulk is actually observed. And I was going to ask you, uh, would you, would you be able to insert um, like a hard boundary condition in your simulation and then, then uh, study what happens in the presence of well, I mean, basically, when you move this boundary or move the fluid with, with respect to this. So it's like adding some obstacle and moving it through the super superfluid. Yes, exactly. Yes, that's sure, sure that that that's um, 
that's another way how how one can quantify this or study this. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, the most of work in this field actually was devoted to um, to derive the formalism and to make this formalism practical. <laughs> and now we start to uh, to study effects. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Please, may uh, Yuri. Oh yeah, thank you, um, Gabriel. Thank you very much. That was a brilliant talk. Um, I have a couple of very quick questions. Um, is it any way to link the uh, dissipation of quantum vortices in fermionic systems with the uh, Karoli matrikon mechanism? That sort of was a pretty popular uh, topic for helium three. Uh, what mechanism? Carly Matricon. Mm. I, I, I feel um, that's the alternative name for the bound states which we have in the vortex course. Right? Here I use the name Android states, but, but you're right, that's the alternative name that people call call this state. So so I think we are we are talking about the same. <laughs> well, perhaps yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, and the other one, uh, again, it, it's sort of a uh, question somehow related to helium-3. Uh, using DFT, can you predict the core size? Core size? Yeah, uh, for the vortex. Well, it, it, it seems interesting because, again, in helium-3, the core size is two orders of magnitude larger than in helium-4. So at least qualitatively, can you can you make uh, this sort of comparison? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I, of course, I don't know whether we can predict because we, we that means that we should compare with some experimental data, which uh, at least for uh, ultra cold atoms, we, we see vertices, but uh, there is no measurements of. of of the size of the vertices, but <clears throat> uh, here's the slide that I skipped. I All right, yeah. show it. But <clears throat> this is the how the vortex core looks like in a in a different interaction regimes. Yes, uh, that 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 what I, exactly what I yeah yes so <clears throat> right. Uh, so in BCS regime, actually, that there are two lamp scales that characterize the vortex. One is the inverse of Fermi energy, where the order parameter behaves linearly, and then there is another lamp scale which is much bigger, which is yeah. coherence lamp. And this scale causes that in a Fermi system, vortices are much much bigger. And of course, psi increases exponentially as, as as we go to the BCS regime because it's 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 co it's correlated directly to the pairing gap. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if I, if I answered your question, but in theory we, we can cal calculate it, but we don't have a data that mm -hmm. compare it and, and, and claim that it's that we predict correctly the, the pairing. Yeah. Well thank you. Yeah. So are there any other questions for, for Gabriel? Um, maybe. maybe I can I can only ask you just, just a specification to the answer um, that you gave before. So, so effectively all the models that you've described are uh, derived in the zero in, in the zero temperature limit. Uh, is that right? Yes, okay. yes. So the calculations that we do is in the zero temperature limit. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> Uh, because now we deal with the quasi-particle states, and in quasi-particle states, uh, going to the formalism again, value of the gen formalism. So the quasi-particle states have an amplitude probability that it's I have a hole there or I have a particle. So the, 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 the equation of motions actually govern how they are occupied if dynamics 
proceeds. So <clears throat> if, if I plot the occupation probability, it changes in a time. So <clears throat> in, in, in some sense, it, it, it may mimic temperature effects, but, but formally we, we use the zero temperature formulas. Right. So it's temperature fluctuation or, or, or just quantum fluctuations or, or? That will be quantum fluctuations. Right? Okay, okay, I see. I see. Mm -hmm. okay. And, and if I, I can also ask another probably stupid question is, so, so when, when you show the, the occupation of, of the Andreev level into a vortex, I mean, the, is, the, is this number always discrete or, or you all also have a, a continuous spectrum at some point? So inside the vortex called the spectrum is discrete. Okay. And continuous spectrum of the uh, of the quasi particle states starts above the um, the pairing gap. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. There is a famous formula in BCS theory that quasi particle spectra is square root of uh, kinetic energy square plus delta square. Okay. Right. Um, are there any other questions for, for Gabriel? Well, if not. Uh, Thank you, Gabriel, again for your really interesting talk. And um